Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn about warehouses of experience, the brain, body, and trauma. My first guest is Dr. Paul Valent, who was born in Bratislava, Slovakia, survived the Holocaust in Hungary, and in 1949, he and his parents moved to Australia. Dr. Valent studied medicine in Melbourne, then psychiatry in London. A psychiatrist and psychotherapist for 35 years, he co-founded the Australasian Society for Traumatic Stress Studies and of the Child Survivors of the Holocaust Group in Melbourne, Australia. He now devotes himself to writing, and he's in the house with me. His recent publications include Heart of Violence, Why People Harm Each Other, From Survival to Fulfillment, A Framework for Traumatology. And this is in a series on uh, trauma and loss, as well as mental health in the times of the pandemic and child survivors of the Holocaust. Welcome, Dr. Paul Vallon. Thanks for joining me on the show today. Hello, Lisa. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Oh, I'm so happy to have you, especially because... You and my next guest afterward is Dr. Thomas Verney, and you, the two of you, have a very unique history that binds you from childhood to present day. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about that story because it's relevant to the theme of today's show. Well, it's a totally amazing, well, we might call it coincidence or who knows, but Thomas, and I'll call him Tommy. Tommy and I uh, were very good friends in Bratislava in Slovakia. And the coincidences are multiple because uh, apart from being friends there, we also have a history of our parents and ourselves, single, only children, escaping to Hungary in 1942, spending the war in Hungary, then returning to Slovakia and becoming and maintaining being friends. Then we... Well, I went to Australia, he went to Canada, but we both became psychiatrists and we both married girls from England, only a few miles from each other. Besides that, we both became psychiatrists, we both write books, um, <laughs> and we both talk to you. And there we are. <laughs> <laughs> you both talk to me and you both focus on similar specialties in your work. I mean, that's not a coincidence based on the stories, right? That, that how you ended up focusing in the areas uh, of trauma. Yes. Well, we are both very interested in like how the past formulates uh, and shapes the present and the future, probably. In some ways, we, are, we overlap quite a lot. And when we talk to each other, we talk the same language or languages, both professional and personal. But yeah, in a way, he has taken a different, he, he's been more interested in the earlier effects of trauma, uh, even before birth. And I've been more interested in the traumas after birth. Not that I'm not interested in transgenerational trauma as well. But uh, yeah, it's amazing how we have overlapped in our interests, um, yeah, to to the present day. <laughs> yes. Okay. What I find interesting about your work, particularly the most recent publication of Heart of Violence, is what you write about the reasons why people harm each other. And I would love for you to share this because it's particularly relevant as we unfortunately see history repeating itself. Yes. My own history is that I just hated. I hated Germans and I hated the Nazis and I hated the Hlinka Guard, which was the local Slovak uh, 
Nazis. And I just saw the world really as good people and bad people, people who would have wanted to kill us and people who wanted maybe to rescue us, which were the minority, by the way. Anyhow, it took me quite a long time, uh, probably, well, decades, and seeing people who had been violent, you know, like all kinds of violence, uh, even traffic accidents on, on, well, so-called accidents on the road, people who bash their wives, and all kinds of, well, violence. And as I uh, progressed in my research, I realized that they all, well, I think all, well, in my experience, I would say all had a history. And I realized that people actually were not born violent, but they were responding to something, be it that they needed to be violent to save their lives at the time, you know, like in Rwanda, if you didn't kill, you were killed. Or well, the same thing applied in Nazi Germany. And I, it was quite a difficult transition to think that what I would have called in the past moralistically bad people, actually in their histories, when you look at them, uh, were also victims. And um, so my book, The Heart of Violence, it, it captures the thing, the heart. We all have hearts, uh, you know, not only anatomical, but... <laughs> souls, if you like. Yes. And, and and violence is connected to trying to survive your heart or, or maintain your heart your and your love, really, of yourself and those that are close to you. Unfortunately, yeah. And so I, I came to realize that it was mainly circumstance that drives you there. Um in evolutionary terms, it makes a lot of sense, you know, to be aggressive and um, to kill and to survive. Unfortunately, it left its mark in our own minds, which are much more complex, and in the last at least 10,000 years have become civilized. But the background, the evolutionary substrate is still there manifests itself and now maladaptively, whereas before it was adaptive to survival, now you know, it can lead to uh, mass ex- extinction. Yeah, so it's a very important topic, I think, and it's very, very important to understand it and try to do something about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I agree. I find one of the things that you said earlier, a few moments ago, about growing up and hating the Germans, hating the Nazis, and then coming to the realization that these people who were doing bad acts were also victims. And I think I'd love for you to to share more about that because there's, I think, a turning point in consciousness, right, where you see the other as also oppressed in some way. Well, let's go to the root of it. Um, Let's go to Hitler. He had a very unhappy childhood. He was, um, well, he lived in poverty. He lived in, surrounded by violence. His father was extremely violent. He was particularly violent to him. As a boy, he was uh, quite neurotic. And his doctor, who was Jewish, at that time suggested that he go to Vienna to be psychoanalyzed. (laughs) Who knows? Maybe he could have gone to Freud, except that his father, who realized that uh, Hitler would be talking about him, didn't agree. So he never went uh, interesting. To, have, to have this analysis. Yeah, it's very interesting. And of course, he grew up to be a very nasty, violent person, uh, as, even as a child. But he had this redeeming feature, which is interesting, that his mother did love him and he loved his mother. And in a perverse way, I think that allowed him to uh, sort of follow what he called his destiny, his star, because he had had sufficient constancy of being cared for to follow his, uh, his path for him in a consistent way. I mean, there was a kind of logic in his path, in his path. Um, but yeah, uh, 
I think had he had a different childhood, had he had a different uh, intervention, I think um, things would have been extremely different. And you can take the, the same thing to Stalin and a number of um, dictators and so on. What's interesting to me at the moment is Putin. Because, yes, um, <laughs> I well, was going to why. ask. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I was going next. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he has a past and... I don't know enough about his uh, personal past, which, but I, know, I think his father and his grandfather, I think his grandfather was a cook to Stalin or, or, or to Lenin. I haven't researched it sufficiently, but there's certainly a history of uh, loyalty to dictatorships. And he, well, his forebears and he himself benefited from dictatorship. And uh, I mean, he himself was a um, was head of the KGB, and he ruled the fact because he was based in East Germany. He ruled the fact that the empire and his power, or the Russia's power anyway, diminished quite markedly. And I think he wants to reestablish that empire. But what else? I don't know. But I'm fascinated, and uh, unfortunately. We're in a delicate situation because I just don't know how much he can take of defeat because yeah. he's always had to win and he's not winning at the moment. So what will he do? And he's threatening you know, nuclear warfare. Who knows? It might be a bluff, uh, but if he's desperate, uh, it's a worry. It's a worry. Indeed. Indeed. And I think I look at contemporary politics and, and history in the making, and it's not just looking at the situation in Ukraine, but I look at other countries where there is are massacres going on on a continuous basis. I'm thinking of Af Afghanistan, where it feels like the Western world has now turned its back in favor of Ukraine in part because it's it seems that it's more imperative, but I'm wondering if there are other issues there with that, and the same with Syria and Sudan. Well, yes, yes. Uh, they all have their histories and they all have things in common. And you don't even have to look that far. I mean, look at America and Trump. Yes, um, that's true. <laughs> at, least, at, least, at least we know a little bit more about his background, which also is not healthy. But the way he survived in his family to be brash. To be a bully. assertive. Uh, be, a, be a bully. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. You, you put it in a nutshell. Yeah. Bluntly, the, the yeah. American way. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. But yeah. And he, tip, he typifies something. Um, I, find, I find it interesting. That, yeah, I think America from here, I don't know if to tell you about America, but, you know, from what I know, things are pretty bad in a sense that it's a bit, I look, I liken it to the French Revolution you know, where there was an aristocracy. And at the moment, the aristocracy in America is the billionaires, yep. the multi-billionaires who live in the luxury that the kings used to, to live in, or the equivalent in a particular society. And then you've got the poor. And um, I believe or I read, you know, a quarter of children in America do not have a sufficient diet. Yep. And that, that really is awful. And so people who, you know, used to believe or maybe still do in uh, fundamental religion and so on and prophets and um, they now have Trump. Let's take a pause at this point and then we'll come back and continue the conversation with Dr. Paul Vallant. To learn more, please visit paulvallant.com. And on Facebook, you may find Dr. Vallant at Dr. Paul Vallant. We're talking about heart of violence, why people harm each other from survival to fulfillment. We'll be right back. Hang on just a minute. Before we take that pause, I want to talk about the importance of making time to play, even for grown-ups. We work hard, and yet we don't always give ourselves the permission to have fiendishly good fun. Everyone deserves a little downtime. When I've got a few spare minutes, I love to amuse myself with Best Fiends, an exciting puzzle adventure game where you can have some silly good times anytime, anywhere. Best Fiends is my go-to digital play pal, and I'm happily hooked. And if you're anything like me, you will be too. 
Not to brag or anything, but I am kicking some serious butt and about to hit level 7,385. I feel like an accomplished champ. The fun never ends at Best Fiends because there's always fresh content and pop-up challenges to conquer. I pinky swear you'll never be bored or run out of goals to achieve. You'll never be stranded without fun at your fingertips and can even play offline. Don't blame me if you end up kind of obsessed. Need a little digital distraction or some mindful mindlessness? Stress less and play more and add a little more joy to your daily routine. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now let's take that quick break. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. And we're back. But before we get back to the conversation, let's talk about the importance of self-care and clean living. Taking good care of ourselves and our planet makes good sense. You've heard me talk about how much I love native products. That's because when we take good care of our bodies inside and out, including the environment, we feel better about ourselves and that makes us happy. All native products are thoughtfully formulated to make clean, simple, and effective personal care. And now, Native is releasing their much-adored deodorants in 100% plastic-free and recyclable packaging. And when you buy Native's new plastic-free recyclable package deodorant, you are saving 37 grams of plastic. Native cares about our bodies and Earth's well-being. Native is a proud partner of 1% for the planet and has committed 1% of its plastic-free deodorant sales to environmental nonprofits. Native has skin in the game because you do too. All Native deodorants are aluminum and paraben-free that kills odor-causing bacteria, provides 24-hour protection to keep you feeling and smelling fresh. Choose from 10 scents, including classic coconut and vanilla. Right now, my personal go-to scent is the lavender and rose in plastic-free packaging. Say yes to environmental friendliness. Be sure to also check out Native's Broad Spectrum SPF 30 Mineral Sunscreens and newest addition to the Native lineup, hand and body lotion. These products are available in some of the yummy scents your nose will love. Go to Native and level up your self-care routine. Ready to try plastic-free deodorant? Go to nativedo.com slash harvesting or use promo code harvesting at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedo.com slash harvesting or use promo code harvesting at checkout for 20% off your first order. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back. We're continuing the conversation with Dr. Paul Vallant. We're talking about warehouses of experience, the brain, body, and trauma. Let's get back to the conversation. So Dr. Vallant, on the break, you and I were talking about sort of the perilous place that we find ourselves at as a, as a world, as a society, and and your hopefulness. And this is where I would love to focus right now is on the hopefulness and how we can impact the future and stop the destruction. Well, Lisa, we were talking about uh, the precariousness of the world at the moment. You know, I mean, here we have a dictator who is losing a war, who is threatening nuclear warfare. Um, he has not lost in the past. He can't take a defeat. What is he going to do? We don't know. That's, that's the sad thing about it. We are facing, in a way, the brink. But we've faced it before. Look, I see a ray of hope. Um, and the ray of hope lies in the fact that the world is repulsed by yes. what is going on. And what they see is what used to go on in times past, you know, where people were, in, or rulers, kings or princes, were intent on conquering territory and making themselves great in the process. But this is, I mean, since World War II, this has been anathema. There have been conflicts, but they were internal. There wasn't a conflict, or maybe, no, there wasn't a conflict where somebody wanted to conquer and stay as a conqueror in another country. So this takes us back 
to memories of World War II. I tell you what, when I see those buildings with the facades gone, it brings me right back to Budapest because that's exactly what I saw. And there are a sufficient number of people who maybe still remember yeah. and people who don't, who are horrified by seeing this and seeing how people are suffering. So, look, there's this ray of hope. <laughs> I might be naive, I might be hopeful, but it's just possible that the world will actually take note and be shocked. I mean, I think the world is shocked. And I, I hope that that shock is going to play out in a positive way to say, no, we can't have this. This is, this is just too awful. It's just too primitive, really. Hopefully, we thought we were more civilized than this. We thought that maybe only countries that are not civilized indulged in uh, this kind of behavior. Um, yeah, well, that's my hope. That I, 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 I might be naive. I don't know. I don't think there's a naivete. I think that the hopefulness is there. I think when we see the brave spirit of the Ukrainian people to not be defeated, to continue to fight, and these are young leaders that are taking charge of Ukraine and leading its people. I, I find that part of it quite inspiring. I, I do think about the generational trauma of these kids, you know, and I think about the moral injury of these young Russian soldiers who are being sent for training exercises and have no idea what they're getting into. And then they arrive and yeah. they see the destruction. Yeah. Oh, look, absolutely. It's like the worst of history repeating itself. Well, maybe not quite the worst, but pretty, pretty, pretty close. Awful. Yeah, pretty, pretty close. Pretty yeah. close. Yeah. yeah, on the model of uh, Second World War, really. Yeah. And then the flip side of it is when we talk about, you know, our bodies and minds that have been traumatized and your research and what we know from history, how people are resilient and how they have risen above circumstance and transcended and transformed those circumstances to come out the other side and find post-traumatic growth. I think that is, is what I find so fascinating. Well, so do I. And, you know, when we think even of by far the worst, which was World War Two, good things have come out of it. And I mean, 70 years of relative peace, unprecedented international cooperation, which raised the standard of living uh, throughout the world. Uh, yeah, so it's possible that we'll be so disgusted by what has gone on in Ukraine around the world that the, that the nations will say, well, this will never happen again. And there's another thing is interweaving here, and I don't know if they are connected, but look, I think it's possible that they are somehow, and that is the pandemic. And the pandemic also hit the world in a way that it hadn't for, well, 1917 was the, the major pandemic. Yes last major pandemic, so there was in a war as well. But and I'm, I don't want to put too much into coincidences. But nevertheless, it's just possible that something positive will come out of the pandemic as well. I, I think bad things are coming out of the pandemic, which is fragmentation of nations and societies and, and, and what we discussed before with Trump and so on. And we've become inward looking and we've had to do that because of the pandemic but the pandemic will pass yes and we have learned all sorts of things from it you know like how quickly you can produce a vaccine and who knows what other vaccines will be produced and they are being uh, researched at the moment and who knows you know what revulsion will come out of this um, isolation and looking after oneself um, you know, being competitive and, you know, I'm, I'm taking your vaccine because I need it <laughs> rather than <laughs> give it and uh, that sort of thing, you know, and, uh, and the fragmentation in trade and international cooperation and all that. So I, I think, look, I hope that it's possible that all that will return in a, you know, like an elastic, <laughs> it will sort of come back with some force. So that is a hope and we will have learned. We've learned all sorts of things, you know, how to work from home. Um, 
you know, how we don't need to commute quite as much. Yeah, we so, could be in our sweats, uh, <laughs> our best professional <laughs> sweats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a part of me, maybe because I survived after all, you know, against the odds. So uh, there is a kind of optimism <laughs> in me that, uh, yeah, maybe... Well, uh, the world will well, survive against the odds as well. I think you have an innate resiliency, you know, strength of heart, strength of spirit that helped you survive, you know, and, and the same thing with Tommy, right? With Dr. Rennie. And yeah. I think the other thing that happened as a result of the pandemic is that because there's been such a focus now on mental health and almost like... um a normalization and validation that normal health must be part of the overall discussion when talking about healthcare, that it's essential, that without mental health, mm. we really don't have health. Well, I hope I have time to mention two things. One, Tommy and I have had two huge advantages, and that is that we both had loving families and our parents were willing to sacrifice whatever was necessary for our own survival. Yeah. And we haven't mentioned the word love. Um, in a funny way, it's become a dirty word in scientific conversations. But I think it is a very basic, very, very basic word. And it is love that's going to get us through and give us resilience and survival. So that's one thing I wanted to say. The other one with regard to the brochure, mental health in the times of the pandemic. Look, I just want to say a little bit. It gives words to hidden feelings. To feel, we, There's a lot that we are feeling, but we can only come up with words like depression and anxiety, maybe domestic violence, maybe post-traumatic stress disorder. But I can assure you that what we're going through is all of what humans are able to go through, both positively and negatively. And there are words for it. And they go back to... The very, well, the, the different ways of survival, we know fight and flight, but there are six others. We have an octave, it's like a music of, uh, or a symphony of traumatic stress, if you like. And I describe the notes and their reverberations uh, in this brochure. So I would just like people to know that it's there. Uh, you can get it online, just look it up and there it is. So you can go to my website and follow it from there. To paulvalent.com. Um, yeah, paulvalent.com. I also recommend my other books, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> please <laughs> plug, please, is, please. So uh, <laughs> this one is the most topical and, and people can benefit from it right now, I think. Yeah. And, and Heart of Violence, I also recommend. I, I think they're that what you call resilience and hope and understanding the violence and then to know what one might be able to do about it, it's so important. And it's not just political violence, you know, it's uh, yeah, everything from domestic to political. And, you know, we still have a lot of children who are violated, unfortunately, and they carry it all the way through their lives. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's still a lot of sexual violence and all kinds of violence. Well, when we don't have a proper language or outlet for the things that happen to us, it manifests perversely, right? From whether it's war to predatory behavior to substance abuse, right? I mean, it's kind of this maladaptive way of managing extraordinary feelings that can't be dealt with. Yeah. Well, these are the words that you plucked out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with you. <laughs> right. I mean, we're all trying to, uh, get, we all try and seek equilibrium in our lives. And if we don't have the, the healthy language, we use the unhealthy language to try and achieve the balance, even if it's temporary, right? If it's inflicting pain and suffering on others, it's giving the person that's inflicting that pain some sense of temporary balance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I couldn't put it better. Yeah. I mean, this uh, is just yeah. what I've observed, you know, in my work as well. You know, it was somebody that uh, abuses substances or inflicts harm upon themselves, cuts themselves. It's a temporary solution to try and just feel normal, even if it's just for a few minutes. It's 
not yeah. useful ultimately. No, absolutely. You're quite right. And the more we can understand, and the more we have the words, the more hope there is. Um, and yeah, the empathy. It takes me back. Yeah, it takes me back to Floyd, you know, about talking therapy. Well, talking isn't just talking, of course, it's giving words to things that bother us, that um, drive us in unhealthy directions. Yeah. Yeah. Important stuff. No. <laughs> But we're taught not to talk, right? We're taught to hold it in that if we, that, that, you know, we don't, we don't air our dirty laundry. We don't let others know that we're suffering because it somehow makes us weak or less than when in reality it's, it's inverse. <laughs> but the good thing is that we are trying, you know, we are trying to find the words, let me put it this way, that what's hidden in the right hemisphere of our brains does want to be uh, expressed in the left hemisphere in the verbal part of our brains that we do need to, we want to know what on earth it is that is hidden in us and please let's make it overt even if it hurts because then we can do something about it and I think ultimately that is the hope Well, both in the pandemic uh, some, that something good will come out of it, we'll understand a bit more and out of um, the violence that is threatening us at the moment. So, so that is my hope. And that is, yeah, look, you've, you've picked the two recent publications that are probably, in a way, the most useful, which is the mental health in the times of the pandemic and the heart of violence, why people hurt each other or harm each other. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're out of time. Yeah. But I think I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to call. Tommy, and, and say, maybe the two of you guys come back together. That might be fun. That would be just amazing. It would, it we'll would do really it. sort of top the, all the coincidences. Let's do it. I, <laughs> and producer Andrea is going to get a call from me. <laughs> but we have to sign <laughs> off for now. To learn more about my lovely guest, Dr. Paul Vallant, please visit paulvallant.com. On Facebook, you can find him at Dr. Paul Vallant. We've been speaking about the heart of violence, why people harm each other, mental health in the times of the pandemic, and child survivors of the Holocaust. Please check them out. Go to paulvallant.com. Dr. Paul Vallant, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. We're going to take that quick pause and we'll be right back. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. Continuing the conversation about warehouses of experience, the brain, body, and trauma. My next guest is Dr. Thomas Verney, who is a clinical psychiatrist and the author of eight books, including The Secret Life of the Unborn Child, which was published in 27 countries and 47 scientific papers. Dr. Verney has previously taught at Harvard University, the University of Toronto, York University, and St. Mary's University. His most recent book and the subject of today's conversation is The Embodied Mind, Understanding the Mysteries of Cellular Memory, Consciousness, and Our Bodies. Welcome, Dr. Verney. Thanks for joining me on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It is a, an absolute pleasure to have you because this is a subject matter I'm personally so interested in, in my work with substance abuse disorders and with trauma recovery. I'd love for you to define for the listeners what cellular memory is. Well, you know, for a long time, scientists have put all their emphasis on the brain, cognition, behavior, all our actions, our thoughts, our memory. It's all in the brain. But about seven years ago, I read this account of a Frenchman, 44-year-old Frenchman, who went to see his doctor because he had a weakness in his left leg. And when they investigated him thoroughly, they found out that actually he only had a tiny part of his brain retained. There was only a sliver of brain 
and the rest of his skull was filled with cerebrospinal fluid, which is called hydrocephalus. Yet this 44-year-old man was a civil servant. He was married. He had two children and behaved and acted totally normally. So when I read that, I began to wonder, how is this possible? How can a person with virtually no brain act and think normally? And so uh, I know we don't have much time, so I'm going to make it as short as I can. I started looking into the literature, and I found that actually there were a lot of reports of children having large parts of their brains removed, adults having large parts of their brains removed, and yet they continued to act normally. So wow. I thought to myself, you know, how is this possible? That is mind blowing. How come, <laughs> how come mind blowing, right? Yes. And how come, how come nobody has thought about this? Like, how come nobody has stopped to think, how is this possible? So I started looking into more and more literature, and I began to see that cells in our bodies, the tissues, the organs, all the cells in our bodies really are much smarter than we have given them respect, than we have given them any respect before, recognition. And I began to see that the whole body is involved in everything that we do, thinking, feeling, acting, memory, and that the body really acts as a kind of a backup system to the brain. For example, just, just to give you one example, uh, some incredible experiments have been done by Michael Levin at Tufts University on planarians, and they have taught planarians to run a certain maze, and then the planarians would be cut up into tiny pieces and what is amazing about planarians, they're the only animal in the world that does this, out of small pieces, let's say out of a tiny piece in the tail, a whole new planarian developed. Wow. But that planarian, that planarian was very good, better than a normal planarian to run those mazes that originally you could say his parent body learned. And the only that could be is through cellular memory. In other words, cells contain memories and then they are passed on to the rest of the body. So these planarians, these tiny, tiny little pieces that grew into a normal planarian were able to remember what originally sort of their parent was taught. Hold yeah. on one second, Dr. Rooney. I just want to like interject that sure. a planarian is a flat worm. for Because for, yes. I didn't yes. know that. I had to just look it up really fast. So, Oh, yes. A planarian is a flat worm. Then you can take an organism like a mold, uh, which is a unicellular organism without any neurons, not, not no neurons at all, and of course, no brain. And yet you can teach it to run mazes. You can teach it all kinds of things. Octopuses have no brains. And everybody knows sort of that octopuses are really smart. Super smart. <laughs> super smart. Super smart. They have no brains. Uh, bacteria, bacteria have no brains. And yet they also learn how to survive. You know, I mean, they are intelligent. So our cells are just much more intelligent than we have given them credit before. And what is even more important in a sense is that they can contain memories. Uh, biologists and computer, computer experts have actually put memories into biological cells. And biological cells can t contain huge amounts of memories. They are like transistors. So when you ask what is cell cellular memory, or, or uh, it's, it's connected to cellular intelligence, which is connected to the fact that cells can contain huge amounts of memory. Let me just paraphrase this for one second, because what I'm hearing yeah. you say is we have the brain, we all recognize that the brain is stored in the yes. skull, but the mind yes. is something yes. that is bigger than the brain. Exactly. 
I wanted to for you to touch upon an example of this, because I remember when I was in graduate school, one of our required textbooks was about people who had had organ transplants and yes. their experiences of receiving these donor organs and them taking on certain taste buds or characteristics of their donors. It's, it's sort of interesting, you know, that there is, a, there is a lot written about that in the popular media, but not in the academic presses. And medical doctors have a way of discounting what regular people say. So, you know, I was just speaking the other day to a doctor in California, and he told me that they conduct many, many heart transplants. I mean, heart transplants have become, you know, almost routine nowadays. But none of the doctors ever, ever tell their patients that there may be some changes in their personality as a result of having received a donor heart. They just, they just don't tell them that. <laughs> they don't believe in it, and they don't tell them that. And yet, when we look at cellular intelligence and we look at what I've just said about memories being retained in cells, we know that some of this can happen. It does not happen in every person, but it happens in a lot of people. And I think a lot depends on the personality of, of, of the recipient. A lot depends on whether they are open to actually recognize changes in themselves. You know, some people are so cut off from their bodies that they don't even notice that there are certain changes that have occurred. Yes, the conscious awareness is not not there because it may be it's, subtle at first, right? Exactly. It's just not there. And there are such huge differences, as you know, between people in terms of how they react to circumstances and to the environment. There's a huge difference. So, yeah, I, I don't think that every person who receives a heart transplant receives also a personality transplant, if we can put it that way. <laughs> or, uh, or suddenly but, like strawberry ice cream instead of chocolate. Yeah, but as you know, just just a week ago or 10 days ago, there was the first pig heart transplant. Yes. That was done. And, you know, here I kind of worry about that because if there is a personality transplant, what is going to happen to a person who receives the heart of a pig or <laughs> any other animal? Yes. I mean, I would love to have had that person continue to live, of course, but also at if he did live, I would love to have him follow up with psychological tests and psychiatric interviews to see if there is any change in his personality. Uh, but I think that before we start, you know, transplanting pig hearts into people, we should look into this a little bit more before we do it. Well, that's fascinating because as you're speaking, I'm thinking, well, would this patient like suddenly like like mud? you know, <laughs> or would they suddenly be more relaxed because their life had less complications? You know, there's maybe the upside, the reverse. There, there may be, they might be, uh, they might be less depressed. Who knows? You know, yeah. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, and, who knows? But because we don't know, you know, before we rush into these huge sort of experimental procedures, we should do a little bit of um, investigation. I'm surprised that there has not been more clinical investigation about organ transplant and personality changes or taste changes, because there's there have been a lot of books written about this subject, and it would make sense. Yes, it would. There is such a high level of resistance by the medical profession to accept anything that they have not learned in school. So, you know, it may be 20 years ago that they went to university and they continue to practice and believe in the kinds of things that they were taught in medical school. You know, like I was taught in medical school, for example, the children before the age of two don't remember anything. But when I started seeing patients who did, I changed my mind. Yeah. Like a lot of doctors, a lot of doctors don't. They don't go they don't go by what patients tell them. 
because in some ways they look down on patients and they think of them as sort of less smart than they are. Yeah, when indeed the patient does know. The patient is is of course very wise. Of course, of course they know. And so, you know, th- this is a huge problem also, you know, going back to to other matters, you know. Let's take that pause and we will continue the conversation with Dr. Thomas Verney about his book The Embodied Mind: Understanding the Mysteries of Cellular Memory consciousness, and our bodies. To learn more, please visit trverneymd.com, on Twitter at verneymd, and on Facebook, trverneymd. Here comes that pause. We'll be right back, and that is a promise. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life. A boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H Factor. Where is your heart? Visit harvestinghappiness.com to learn more. We're back, continuing the conversation with Dr. Thomas Verney about warehouses of experience, the brain, body, and trauma. Let's get back to it. So Dr. Verney, coming back, I would love to talk with you about, you know, cellular memory and how it impacts events, major events in our lives like trauma. For example, in the past two years, the world has experienced and is experiencing what I believe to be two, and I think you do too, two global traumas, one being COVID, the pandemic, and the second being the war that is raging in Ukraine. And each of us is affected by these traumas in different ways. And the trauma, that legacy, how it is perpetuated on generations to come. And I'm also interested about how women who are pregnant, how it affects their unborn children. So. I think if, if we start in terms of the unborn children, we have many studies now that show that fathers, for example, who are stressed even before conception, this is very important, even before conception, fathers who are stressed are passing on that stressed response to their children and even to the second generation, to the children's children. Wow. And yes. I did not and know the that. that yeah, and the way that is passed is through their sperm, through their sperm, uh, to use a uh, academic term, sperm micro RNA. You you know about RNA and DNA, and I'm sure, yes. and our and our listeners, I'm sure, know about that too. Basic micro, <laughs> very basic. Yeah, basic. <laughs> okay, so micro RNA is a particular type of RNA, and it has been shown. Um, to, to be exact, by uh, Dr. David Dixon at Tufts University in Massachusetts, it has been shown that sperm carry microRNAs with their genetic material, and that microRNA sh- uh, carries the impact of stress on fathers. And boy children of those fathers will also carry those microRNA in their sperm so that their children will also be born stressed. So stressed father's children will be born stressed, and their children, second generation, will also be born stressed. The same thing happens with with mothers. Uh, And so their ova are going to carry the information about stress in the preconception area. And then, of course, if we go into the pregnancy, uh, we have... We have research from uh, we have research from Israel, for example, uh, that during the uh, that women who were pregnant during the Arab-Israeli War had uh, their children 
had a much higher rate of schizophrenia than children born to women who were not pregnant. Wow. Dr. Yehuda, Dr. Yehuda in, in New York uh, has done a lot of studies on the, the children of Holocaust survivors. And they all show, they all show, you know, negative imprints of the Holocaust in their personalities, uh, in their reactions to stress. Uh, and of course, this is going to continue to happen in the examples that you have given. In addition to this of the Holocaust and the war in the Ukraine now, uh, and all other wars, you know, of which we have had plenty actually during the last 50 years. Also, if you look at what's happening to racialized groups, if you look at in Canada, for example, which is where I live, if you look at people, the word is escaping me. I'm thinking of indigenous, but it's not. Um, like the First Nations, like the, uh, is that yeah, what you mean? Nations, yes, that's it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Sorry. Um, so when you look at First Nations, both in the United States and in Canada, when you look at black people, when you look at uh, various people in the world who have been subjected to abuse and all kinds of other difficulties, they all carry what has been referred to in the past as historical trauma in their bones, in their yeah. cells. And I will just give you one example, one example of this, uh, which is really quite dramatic. Uh, one of the elders told a friend of mine that when he was in one of these residential schools in Canada, where children were incredibly abused, uh, Every night when he was a child, a man dressed in like in black in a black gown and wearing a black mask would come in and pick up one of the children and take that child away and abuse during the night. Oh. When this man grew up and had a child, that child would have terrible nightmares. And she would never tell <laughs> the father what the nightmares were about until she grew up, until she was 16 years old or so. When she was around 16 years old, she finally told the father what her nightmares were. Her nightmares were that a man all dressed in black with a black mask would come in and take her away. Wow. So she so, carried, she carried her father's carried, trauma in her DNA. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Wow. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, that is an extreme example um, because it's like a complete story in a way. Uh, most people don't have that kind of picture memory, if you like, uh, but they do have, they do have an unconscious fear of things or they are more afraid, generally speaking, more anxious, more depressed. All of these things are going to happen, of course, to the children and the people, too, in Ukraine. Yes. Uh, because, I mean, you know, one of the things that we have to understand about the new genetics, which is called epigenetics, is that we are, our genes are constantly changing. As you and I speak, our genes are constantly changing in, re in, in reaction to the environment, in response to the environment. And it's not that, that the genes are changing, but their expression, which is what genetics call activation, changes. So it's the same genes, but genes can be deactivated, put to rest, or activated by the environment. And that's terribly, terribly important. That's another very new area of investigation which is so relevant to our lives. And therefore, anything that's stressful can affect your whole body. And anything that's pleasurable, this is really important, anything that's pleasurable increases all the good things happening in your body. It changes the genes which protect you against infection and inflammation. It just has so many 
positive reactions, outcomes. So surrounding yourself, you know, surrounding yourself by positive people, loving people uh, will increase your resistance to inflammation, infections, uh, make you think better. On the other hand, you know, going back to the war and the Holocaust, all those things, of course, uh, will affect you in a very negative way. And then there are those who come through these traumatic experiences who yes. find, you know, purpose and meaning from those experiences yes. and then their place in the world and seem yes. to rise above circumstance. And I think that that is that's the part to be studied, you know, that that at that strength absolutely. of heart and resilience. 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 Yes. yes, absolutely. Very, very important. Very important to look at that and see how some people, like you say, are able. I mean, look at Zelensky, you know, in Ukraine. I mean, the man is amazing. He's a leader, a true leader, you know. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, sometimes people like that who did not stand out in the past, when it comes to rising to the event or the circumstance, do rise and, yeah. and become heroes. Yeah. Let's study that. Yeah, let's, let's study that. Let's yes, study yes. that. Bo I mean, bottle it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> sure. I mean, even look at Churchill, for example, you know, who did not have a uh, splendid career until he became prime minister. And then he was incredible. Yeah. Well, your work is so fascinating to me. It touches upon, you know, every area of my personal interest and its application to the healing and recovery process. So for me, it's very, very helpful. We're out of time today. So I wanted to just remind our listeners that I'm speaking today with Dr. Thomas Verney. He is the author of The Embodied Mind, Understanding the Mysteries of Cellular Memory, Consciousness, and Our Bodies. To learn more, please visit trvernymd.com, on Twitter at VerniMD, and on Facebook, trvernymd. Dr. Verney, thank you so much for sharing part of your day with me and your brilliance, because the world needs to hear more about this. Thank you so much for having me. A pleasure. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa cypress Kamen on behalf of my guests, Dr. Paul Vallant and Dr. Thomas Verney, wishing you kind thoughts kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day, and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere, from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with TogiNet Radio, KBUU RadioMalibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange. <laughs>